Praise the Lord. Well, listen, I'm excited today uh, to go over a topic that I wasn't planning on teaching on. But, you know, um, one of the interesting things about being a pastor is when you stand up here, you never know what's going to come out of your mouth sometimes. So I always pray and I always want to make sure that everything that I say is accurate from the scriptures. And last week we were, we were talking about, we finished up our series on excellence. But remember, just because we finished the series, that is still what we are purposing to do in every area of our life this year. This is the word of the Lord for this church this year, is to strive for excellence in everything that we do. So that is going to be a continued conversation throughout the year. But one of the things that I mentioned last week was the, the whole idea of salvation and our, and our safety in it and the, the, what it means to, to be saved, but also the fact that maybe you could lose your salvation. And I recognize that while I, I referenced scriptures on this, I didn't do a, a, a thorough enough job teaching on it because this is a very heavily debated topic within the body of Christ. It is something that is talked about, and it's been talked about for centuries, but today we're going to solve it. No, I'm serious. Because, because what, what happens is, is when we hear something that we're not accustomed to, it can make us feel a little uncomfortable. And that's an uncomfortable topic because there's so many different opinions about it. But uh, me being the simple person that I am, I believe that if we read the Bible, it takes care of everything. It really does. Today we try and get so sophisticated in our theology that we can miss the simplicity of the gospel. So today, I want to speak to you just on what is salvation, what does it entail, how do we obtain it, and then what are these two different perspectives that we see in the scriptures about once saved, always saved, versus someone who believes, as I do, that it is something that could be lost along the way. So I want you guys to hang with me. How many of y'all got your Bibles this morning? Raise them up. Let me see them. Phones count. Phones count. Amen. 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 If you don't have your Bible, look on. The reason I want you to have it every week is because how are you going to know if I'm lying to you unless you see it for yourself in the word? The Bible says that in the last days, many deceivers will go out teaching things that they ought not. And we see that today. You got 75 different denominations that believe all these different things. And we are non-denominational. I am. I, I don't even like the word denomination. Denominator is the thing that divides. We are just a Bible-believing church. So today I want to look at what the Bible says about what it is to be saved. And it's important for us to know this as believers, and also if you're in this place and you don't yet believe or you're still searching, let me tell you, there is a God in heaven who loves you, and He has salvation for you. To be saved. And we're going to answer the question, to be saved from what? How did He do that? How do I get involved with that? If it sounds good to you, and trust me, is the best thing that will ever happen to you. And then what does that mean for me to the rest of my life here on earth? I want to answer those questions today. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. And while, as we're turning there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being in this place with us. Lord, I'm honored that I get to stand in this pulpit and speak your word to your people. But Lord, I also approach it with a tremendous amount of fear and reverence, because I understand that the words that I say carry weight to those who are hearing. So Lord, it is of the utmost importance that you speak through me here today. As we open up your word, we ask that you would enlighten our understanding of it, that you would strengthen us, Lord God, with the courage we need to adopt it and be changed by it, Lord. And it's, it's not enough just to hear your word. We have to be doers also. So Lord, be our teacher today. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. And Lord, I pray for all the hearts and the minds of those who are here. I pray, Lord, that they would be open and ready to receive the implanted word of God that is able to save their soul. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The whole reason that Jesus came, and again, Jesus being the manifestation of God here on earth in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. The whole reason of his coming can be found in John 3.16, probably the most quoted verse in the Bible, and we'll read it here. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the summary of the gospel. This is the purpose of Christ. But I want to continue on to John 3, 17. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, through, uh, but that the world through him might be saved. Everybody say saved. saved. They, uh, didn't they have a, a show out called Saved or something like that? It was a movie? Was it, was it Christian or anything? No, it was it, okay. All right. Yeah, we get that. A woo! Bam! Saved. We hear it all the time. Are you saved? Are you saved? Everybody saved, 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 saved. What on earth does this mean? In the Greek, the word saved is sozo. Everybody say sozo. You can say that with any accent you want. It sounds good. Sozo. It's a good name. I'm going to name my son Sozo. Saved. This word in the Greek means to rescue, listen, to rescue from danger. To rescue from danger, to make safe. So when Jesus says, I came to save you, it means that you're in danger and I've come to rescue away from it. All of humanity is in danger. That's what being saved means. So if you're in this place and you don't know God, or you don't know Jesus, let me tell you right now, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be dramatic or anything, but you're in danger. You're in danger. That, the only people that need to be rescued are the ones that are in danger of something. What are we in danger of? The Bible says clearly that the wages of sin is death. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are in danger of death. We say, preacher, that doesn't make sense because everybody dies. Yes, we all die physically, but not everybody will die spiritually. There is what the Bible calls a second death, and that means to be separated from God for eternity because that's what death is anyway. Death just means separated. When we die physically, our soul, our spirit is separated from our body, and our body returns to the ground from which it came, and our soul and our spirit return to God from which it came. It is a separation that happens. So when we are dead to God, we are separated from him. And when we are separated from God for all eternity, that is a very dangerous thing because there's only two places to go when we die. There's only two, two eternal resting places. There is in the presence of God and in the absence of the presence of God. One is called heaven because God is all things that are good and lovely and joyful and peaceful. And to be separated from him is to be separated from all things that are good, joyful, lovely, and peaceful, which means that is hell. Hell is the eternal separation from God full of regret and despair. And it's not that God sends anyone there. We choose that. We choose that. We can talk about that a little bit more later, but I want you to understand what we are saved from. So every human being has a need to be saved. You need to be rescued. You're in danger. I, I always picture those old films from the 1920s where you got the guy with the mustache. He's like, ha, 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 ha. And for some reason, he always wants to take the woman and tie her to a train track. Everybody seen that in the cartoons and everything? Take the woman, tie her to the train track. I'm like, wow, how awful is that? Who thought of that? What, how did that become the norm for rescuing by the day? But it's still powerful, and I love the, the image of it, because here we are, bound by our sin, laid on the tracks of this life and this culture, and there is a train coming called hell, and it's coming. And it's going to be on time. And we are hopeless, helpless to get ourselves out of the situation. You're not going to pull a Batman where he can wiggle down and he just happens to have some laser on his belt, and he lasers the thing, and you can rescue yourself. No, there is no getting out of this. You have no utility belt for this. You need a savior. I need a savior. The sin that bound me, I was helpless against. But thanks be to God that Jesus came charging in. Not on a white horse, even though that's coming. He came in as a lowly, humble builder. He came in 
not with guns blazing, but with love blazing, and said, I'm here to save the day. But one of the things that's interesting these days, anyone in the medical field knows, is that you can't just go up and try and save someone's life anymore. Because they'll sue you if you hurt them. <laughs> Do you all know that? So in the medical field, and I don't know the exact terminology, I, I'm not trained in this yet. But you have to go up, and as best as you can, ask the person if, they would, if you have permission to save them. This, am I lying? Anybody, any nurses in here? Isn't this the truth? Would you like me to save your life so you don't choke to death? Hello, would you like me to do CPR so that you can continue to live? I don't know if you can respond, but I'm going to do CPR or something like that. So there, there has to be some sort of communication. I don't know exactly what it is. Somebody can Google that later. But I know that that's part of the process and part of what they teach. Because the process of rescuing someone, you can break ribs, you can do all these things. It can be a, a, a very dangerous process. So people have actually been rescued, and because they sustained some level of damage, they've gone and sued the person that rescued them. You're like, what kind of craziness is that? Well, guess what? We do that to Jesus all the time. Jesus comes in and saves us, and then because he damaged our culture, you want me to do what? I need to stop doing what? Oh, forget that. I'm turning my back on you. But I, but I saved your life. Yeah, but you didn't do it the way I wanted to. I wanted you to save me and then allow me to continue to do the things I wanted to do. So I'm putting you on trial, Jesus. You're not worthy. I'm going to go back to what I'm doing. So Jesus comes in and he says, look, you can choose me or you cannot choose me. I offer you everlasting life, joy and peace forevermore. I promise you that you, you will have trial in this time. You will have tribulation, but I'll be with you the entire time. You will not be alone and you'll come out on the other side. I promise you that. Or you can have your way. The Bible says that there is a way that seemed right to the man, but the end thereof is death. Again, separation. So what are we saved from? We are saved from eternal separation from him. Acts chapter 2. The apostles, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, continued this ministry. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was first given when they were in the upper room, and they came out. And Peter, who was once a coward, afraid to even say the name of Jesus to a serving girl around a small fire, now stands up in front of thousands in Jerusalem, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, and preaches the gospel to them. The first time the gospel is preached by someone full of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 40, if you'll turn there with me. Verse 40, he says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So at the end of his preaching, he says, Look, you need to be saved, rescued from the danger of this perverse generation. Again, in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. If you flip back a little bit, he, he gives an indication. This is... A quotation from the prophet Joel. He says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in that, he gives us an indication of what we're going to answer next, which is, how do we obtain salvation? How do we know that we are saved? How do we know that we have been converted? A conversion to Christ. Not just an understanding of who Christ is, but actually allowing Him to come in and transform our lives and we become one with Him. In Joel chapter 2, he says, And those who, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I want, I want to present this process to you in a picture that the Lord speaks of often in the Bible, and that is the process of marriage. Marriage is designed to be the greatest picture of the relationship between Christ and his people. It's a marriage relationship full of love, respect, 
understanding, intimacy, power, and life. And when we look at Joel here, it says, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word call is kara in the Hebrew, kara. And it means literally to call out, to cry out to. But there's also a very interesting way that it's used as well. And that means to call oneself, to call oneself something. So there's a, there's a picture of when we call on the name of the Lord, there is a betrothal. Just as in our culture, in many cultures, the bride takes the name of the husband, we as a church, we take on the name of Jesus. When we call on his name, we are called now by his name. Is the acceptance of all that he is and the transfer of that into all who we are. We call on him and we call ourselves by his name. And that's a deeper meaning than just crying out to somebody. Because how many of y'all, before you really gave your life to Jesus, cried out to him many times? Yes. Oh, Jesus, save me. Oh, now you want me. (laughs) When you're in trouble. When the cops are chasing you because you know you did wrong. When you got caught cheating on that test. When the IRS is knocking on your door because you accidentally messed up some numbers. Now we're going to cry out to Jesus. So it's more than just crying out and saying, Jesus. I recalled a story in the Bible where there were seven sons of a, a, a prominent Jewish priest named uh, Sceva, and they were going out, and they were trying to exercise demons. And they came up to this one guy, and they said this. They said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. That just doesn't sound powerful, does it? That's like, oh yeah, I know that dude. He's a friend of a friend of a friend of mine. Then you don't know him. You know about him. And the demon said, "Mm." first of all, you know there's a problem when the demon started talking back. (laughs) You should have been gone. But he turned around and said, let's see, Jesus I know for sure. That's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Paul I know, because I know he serves him. But brother, who are you? (laughs) And then all I could see is just, uh uh-oh. And this guy leapt on these seven dudes, beat them up, and they ran out naked and bleeding. But they said Jesus. See, it's not the pronouncing or the vocalization, the air passing your vocal cords to create a sound. That's not what does it. People say, when you say the name Jesus, demons flee. Not just saying Jesus. First of all, his name wasn't Jesus. That is translated from the Greek. It's actually Yeshua is what he was called. But he has many translations in many languages. Yeshua, Jesus, Isa, Jesus. If you, every time you yell, Jesus, are demons fleeing? No. You know why? Because it's not just saying the name. It's the understanding of the reputation and the person who carries it. That's what matters. That's what matters. So when we call out to Jesus, it means that we have an understanding of his name and reputation and not only crying out to him to save us, it's a cry out to him that be with me. It is the acceptance of the proposal that he gives to us. And that is the picture that the Bible preaches. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that there is a great mystery when he's giving counsel to husbands and wives and how they are to treat each other. He says, this It's a great mystery I speak to you, but I speak of Christ and his church. So the same way that a husband is supposed to cherish and love and adore his wife, and a wife is supposed to respect and honor her husband, that is the relationship that is supposed to exist between us and Christ. We are supposed to submit to and love and respect and reverence the Lord as he loves and cherishes us and prove that by giving himself for us. So it is a a marital relationship. So relating that to salvation, let me tell you about the Jewish traditions of uh, being married. Back during this time, it wasn't, they didn't get married 
the way we get married in these times. And I'll tell you, their divorce rate was a lot lower. There's, here are some, some, some aspects of it. Number one, the parents were directly involved. The parents were directly involved in the marital process because the idea is if you're going to make this most important decision that according to the scriptures is forever, then you should have the wisdom of the people who raised you up in the things of God involved in it. Young people, I strongly suggest that you have, so long as your parents love the Lord and follow him, that you have your parents involved in the choosing and acceptance of the person that you are going to marry for the rest of your life. Amen. If your parents are absolutely crazy, then go ahead and push them aside. <laughs> but find a mentor or somebody that you trust who knows the Lord to be involved in that process. It is too important not to. Hallelujah. It is too important not to. They need to be involved. Before I asked Jen to marry me, I asked my father two questions. Number one, do you think I'm ready? And number two, what do you think about this girl? And he said, yes, you are, and A+. Plus. And I said, amen. <laughs> and here we are, 19 years later, six babies, hallelujah, and love each other more than anything. But the parents were involved, number one. Number two, there was an understanding and there was an agreement. There wasn't this, oh, but I love him, oh, and infatuation is like, no, we need to get down to business here. I don't want to take all the romance out of it. The, the romance is there, but you also have to have a, a logical understanding. If you just go by your feelings, you're going to be in trouble. You're just going to be in trouble. So they sat down and they wrote what was called a ketubah. The ketubah was a marital agreement between husband and wife, and it was what they could expect from each other. It was an actual vow and, and contract. And so when you say your vows before the Lord when you get married, it's not just some traditional thing that you just blurt out. These are a contract written in eternity between you, your spouse, and the Lord. You better put some thought into it. Anyone that I ever counsel on getting married, I'm like, y'all, write your own vows. Do your very best, because this is what you're committing to one another. And you need to have a little bit of a conversation about it. It's not just some romantic poem that you can look back on, oh, wasn't that sweet? It's something that you can look at and say, now, wait a minute. You said that you were going to love and cherish me. I'm not feeling that. We need to have a conversation here. I know, it just went real business on you. But we have to have those things in place. Otherwise, there's no stability. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So they had an understanding of what they were getting into. Then once they had the ketubah, it was written, it was not signed. There was a token that was given, a dowry given by the, bride, uh, by the bridegroom, the husband, to the family during the betrothal period. So today we use a ring, and back then they adopted a ring as well. But it wasn't just a ring, it was something of value that says that we are together, we are betrothed. And then the bridegroom would go away to prepare a place. Remember, Jesus said, Behold, I go away to prepare a place for you, so that where I am you may be also. It was tradition that the bridegroom would go and literally build a house for them. Oftentimes, because they were, uh, they were in a place where they maybe didn't have enough money yet, then they would go and build onto their father's house. That's why Jesus said, In my father's house are many dwellings. Because the tradition was you go to your father's house and you build a separate room connected to it because the family was very important. And then once that was done, then the bridegroom would come back for his bride and you didn't know when he was coming because you didn't know when he was finished with the work. So this is important to understand as we look at the process of redemption and God's process for coming to get his bride. We are in the process of receiving salvation. It is not something that completely is. It is something that is, is developing, and will be. You all understand? This is why many times in the Bible it says, the Lord references those who are being saved. Aren't they all ministering spirits, speaking of angels, sent forth to those who are being saved? Because it is a in the present process that is happening. Now, how do we obtain salvation? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. Starting 
starting at verse 1. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, and which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So he's saying, look, we were all sinners. There is nobody in here that is so holy, you've just been floating on clouds since the day you were born. That is a lie. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all obeyed our lusts. We have all gone astray. Everyone. Verse 4, but God. Don't you just love it? Everybody say, but God. But God. No, no, you got to say it with some like, uh, you got to say, but God. but God. See, doesn't it just sound better? It just feels better like, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy. Gosh. When you think about being, people being rich, you think about all this money. God is rich in mercy. That means he has an overabundance, overflowing of mercy. That means no matter what you've done, he's got enough mercy to cover it. doesn't matter what sin bill you racked up, he's got enough mercy to cover your bill. Isn't that amazing? There should be some freedom that you feel in that. God has enough to pay for your mistakes, and he is rich in mercy. Why? Because of his great love with which he loved us. You know, it's hard to get mad at someone when they, when they love you so much. It's hard, to, it's hard to, to get mad at God when things aren't going right, when you understand that he loves you so much. You can look at life and even the difficult things and say, you know what, I know you love me, so there must be something that I'm gaining through this, and I know you're going to hold me and carry me. It's because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now listen, is anybody physically sitting on a throne with Christ? No, you're sitting on some very uncomfortable chairs at Palmelo Elementary School. And by the way, I appreciate your faithfulness. Y'all are real Christians. I'll tell you that right now. I know this. But he's speaking figuratively, and he's speaking of those things which are to come, that we are in him. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Remember, he said, in the ages to come. That means that there is a place that we are going to. We have not yet arrived. We are in that betrothal period. See, when you say yes to Jesus, Jesus gets down on his knees and says, I love you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will cherish you and I will take care of you. I will be your God. You will be my bride. Do you accept me? And we say yes to him. And we begin the process of planning the wedding feast. But are we fully married yet? No. We are betrothed. I am set apart for. I am holy and separated to Christ because I bear his, his name and his ring. And on that day, we will be wed. And we will be with him forever. And the Bible talks about a wedding feast. Have we had a wedding feast yet? No. So we are in process for those things which are to come. But look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You don't get saved because you're so good. You get saved despite the fact that you weren't so good. It is grace that saves you through faith. You can't do enough good to make Jesus love you anymore and want to rescue you. He wanted to rescue you at your worst. He looked at you at your worst and said, I want to marry that. I think back to when Jen said yes to me. I'm like, what were you thinking? I wasn't, I wasn't the dude I needed to be. But God knew that at the time I would become that, and I needed her in order to transfer into that. Amen. That's what he saw. And I'm still not there. I'm still learning to be a better husband, a better father, a better pastor, a better person, a better son to my father. 
So I'm still in that process. But it began with grace through faith. We believe. Acts 2, 38. Go back there real quick. I told you we're going to be all over the place. I'm not hearing enough turning. Y'all don't just rely on the screen. You need to know where this is in the Bible. You know, when you go out to share the scriptures with people, two giant screens and Brian are not going to show up that just send scriptures up so you can quote them. Y'all know that, right? That would be wonderful. But y'all need to know where this is in the Bible. So Acts chapter 2, getting back over there. And we're going to look at verse uh, 38. When you're there, say amen. amen. You know why pre- preachers uh, do that? It's a stall tactic because I'm not there yet. I'm just divulging all the secrets here. Go to 36. This is the end of, of Peter's message. And man, Peter preaches a message. These are the very people that were yelling, crucify him about Jesus. And he comes out with the Holy Spirit and just nails them. In verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Drop the mic. That was the end of his sermon. Just boom. This wasn't some feel-good message like, God wants you to be happy every day, and he wants you to be blessed, and he's going to grow your business. It was like, you killed Christ. You need to repent and get right now. Otherwise, you're going to hell. And they're like, what? Verse 37, listen. Now, when they heard this, They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were like, I believe. Tell me right now what I need to do so I can get right. Then what does Peter say? How how do we get saved? He said, listen, repent. 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 And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So what do he say? Number one, we repent. We repent. In order to repent, we need to first recognize that there's something to repent for. When we are going to be saved, we need to recognize the danger that we're in. I've seen, you guys see these videos, and there's somebody coming along to rescue someone. It's usually when it's domestic violence. Some, there'll be some fool hitting on his, on his girlfriend or his wife, and somebody comes up to take the guy over, and then she turns around and starts hitting the dude that's rescuing her. I'm like, what is wrong? What is going on here? We need to, she needs to recognize that she needs to be rescued and say thank you to the rescuer. But because she hasn't recognize that she needs to be rescued, she turns on the one who's come to rescue. First step in repentance is recognize. Recognize that we are in a place that we need to be rescued. Recognize that we have, we have sinned. Raise your hand if you've sinned in here. If you didn't raise your hand, you just lied. So raise two hands because you just did it again. We've all sinned. We have all sinned. So we need to recognize that. What we've done When we do that, this immediately pulls us to a position where we recognize that we've done wrong, and it automatically draws us to, not have I just done wrong, it's what I've done to someone. I have done something to my Creator. You must acknowledge that there is a God, and that He is the one who is judge over you, and He is the one you need to apologize to. You don't have just something to apologize for, you have someone to apologize to. And not just an apology, a repentant heart. One that turns from their ways. That's what repent means. It means you recognize that you're going in the wrong direction. Recognize it is an offense to your creator. And then you turn in the other direction and say, I'm going to go this way. That's repentance. So he says, repent. Turn. And then he says, and let every one of you be baptized. So before we get to baptism, I want to go to Romans uh, 10, verse 9. I want to make sure that this is all clear. So we repent. We believe on the name Lord Jesus. And part of the way that that's manifested is seen in Romans 10, uh, verse 9. Turn to Romans 10, 9. Let me hear those pages. Now, if you've got your phone, you're doing this, so I know you, I'm not going to hear nothing. That's all right. Romans, chapter 10. Oh. I got to hurry. Okay. But what does it say? The word is near you. Uh, this is verse, th- verse 8. 
But what does it say? That the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, word of faith doesn't mean you go around telling everything that it's yours. I command you, car, to be mine. You know, this is mine. Word of faith is... No, the word of faith is the faith that you have that you speak out of your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. It doesn't mean you go around saying, I will have a Ferrari, and then a Ferrari just pops up out of nowhere and it's yours. That is called lunacy. That does not make sense. Verse 9. Listen, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Boom. You confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, and you will be saved. Now, is that all you have to do? A lot of times we take this one verse and say, that's it, that's all you got to do. No, there's a connotation, there's an understanding that if you truly believe, then you will walk out the rest of what Jesus has commanded us. It's not just, well, you confess and you believe, and then you're done. No, that is the beginning of the process. If this was, if this was a marriage, that is the yes, I do. That is the, yes, I, I accept your invitation. Great. Now there's some things that we're going to do in, in preparation. And these, are, and these are not the words of Jesse. These are the words of the Lord. So we confess with our mouth. But turn to John chapter 3. What else does Jesus ask us to do? John chapter 3. What did Paul say there in, in Acts 2? That you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For the, uh, uh, let, and then uh, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They ask, what do I need to do? You need to be baptized. There's this whole conversation. Do you need to be baptized in order to be saved? My question is, why are you even asking the question? Jesus said, be baptized. Why are we looking for a reason to get out of something that Jesus said? That's the wrong heart. If Jesus is our Lord and Savior and he asks us to do something, I hop too. I say, yes, sir. He could have asked us to do anything. He, said, he could have said, go throw sand in someone's face and thou shalt be saved. Guess what? You better not be near me because you're going to get a face full of it. But he said, be baptized. And there's all reasons for that. But he said, be baptized. So if he says, be baptized, yes, sir, I'm going to be baptized. Look at what he says in John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered. Uh, this is uh, speaking to Nicodemus. He snuck away at night to ask Jesus about what he had to do to inherit salvation because he was scared of the people that he was working with. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He says, be baptized. We have a baptism coming up. You should be baptized if you have not been baptized. And if you were baptized when you were a little kid, you should be baptized with the fullness of understanding. You see no children baptized in the scriptures, only those who are full age and who understand. And, and, and sprinkling doesn't count. Jesus said, be baptized, not take a shower. Baptism means submersion. The word actually means submerged. It means you go under because it represents you being fully submerged in Christ. It also represents you being fully dead and then being raised to life again in Christ. You have been in the grave and come up just like Jesus did. And there's a spiritual connection that happens there. There's a transfer that happens there. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him and alighted upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Something happens. I was baptized first when I was eight years old. I didn't know what was going on. This uh, older guy, Dr. Westford, baptized me, and I came up, and I was like, whew, he didn't drown me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I was baptized the second time at 33 years old with my brother Don because the Lord told me, you need to be baptized again. And he told me specifically, your brother Don will baptize you. Scales fall off my eyes. My life changed, and I became different. Hallelujah. I became connected to God in a different way than I'd ever been before. You need to be baptized. Again, in Mark 16, 16, Jesus says this, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Is that, do y'all need the Greek on that? That's pretty simple, right? I like just reading the Bible. When people have to extrapolate all kind of weirdness in order to justify something, I'm like, you're dancing a little bit too much. The more you have to dance around the scriptures to try and twist it to mean something that it doesn't say, the more wrong you are. That is deception, and it is a lie. And anyone who does that, they may not want to, but they are a liar. If you're teaching a lie, then that is teaching false doctrine. So if you say something that's false, that's false doctrine, and you're a teacher of false doctrine, correct? I mean, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's right there. 
He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So we believe, we confess, we repent, but it is also he wants us to be baptized. So yes, we will be baptized. Well, what about the guy on the cross who believed in Jesus and he didn't get baptized? Well, look, we don't make exceptions. We, we go by the rule. If a cop pulls you over because you're going 90 down the freeway and he has an abundance of mercy that day and says, you know what, I'm going to let you go with a warning. You're like, oh, guess what? That means we can all drive 90 miles an hour. Wrong. It means God, he made an exception. I catch you doing it again and you're going to jail. God's no different. Yes, I made an exception for this person because he's hung to a cross. He can't be baptized, but you are not. Anybody hung to a cross in here? No. Be baptized. <laughs> it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. All right. I can tell you right now, we're going to have to conclude this next week. So we're going we're gonna to put a pause here. Thank you. Oh. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm leading into two different perspectives that we have on, on the fullness of salvation. So now that we've seen that you repent, repent, you believe, and be baptized, I want to present these two perspectives to you, and I want to invite you to do some reading on your own. So you guys get a pen and paper out. I want you to read on your own this week and, and read what I'm going to tell you so you can see with your own eyes and do your own research, and then when we come back next week, when I, when I talk to you about it, we can be on the same page, and you've already heard from the Spirit, so I'll be bringing confirmation rather than revelation to you. There are two different perspectives on this idea of, uh, now that we know what salvation is, w- the, the fullness of it. One is, is that once you confess and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you are saved completely at that moment, and there is nothing that you can do to not be saved. You say a prayer, you believe in your heart, and you're done, and that's it. There's this school of thought. And then over here on this school of thought is that, yes, you can confess and believe in your heart, but that is the beginning of your salvation journey, and you can abandon it along the way. So this would be you can lose your salvation, as they call it, or this one over here is called the once saved, always saved, or they also call it the preservation of the saints is the official theological doctrine, the preservation of the saints. And there's, there's scriptures that support both. They loosely support one. I want to give you a list of scriptures, and I'll tell you right now, as you go to read them, I'm not going to say what scripture says what, but you're going to find that the scriptures that I've given you are heavily lopsided in one direction. That's not my attempt to try and manipulate or persuade you in any way. It's just because that's what's available in the Bible. You'll also notice that many of the scriptures are plainly written, while others have a little bit of uh, allegory and a mystery associated with them that leaves their uh, open to a little bit more interpretation. So you'll see those that are expressly written and those that are more interpretive or can be interpreted a little bit differently depending on how you you read the scripture. So I want to preface that with you. So, those are the two schools of thought. You guys ready? Yeah. And, and I'll do this. I'll send these out on the weekly email. If you do not have uh, your email on file with us, you're not getting the, the weekly emails, then um, the best way to do this would be to um, connect card. Fill out a connect card. Listen, if you write like a doctor, find a teenage girl, and ask them to please write your email for you so we can read it. You know, listen, write the email and make it plain so those who read it can run with it and email you all the information. First Jesse, chapter 2, verse 2. Okay. So I will get those out to you this week. But here they are. John 10, verses 25 through 30. And feel free, these are the specific verses. I always encourage people, read the entire chapter, everything before and everything after, so you get the complete context of what Jesus is saying and who he's talking to. Yes, I'll repeat every one of them twice. If you don't get it after the second time, then get the person next to you. So John 10, 25 and 30. John 10, 25 and 30. 
John chapter 15, the whole thing. John chapter 15, the whole thing. Romans chapter 11, the whole thing. Again, that's Romans 11, the whole thing. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Revelations, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Some of you are going to do more reading this week than you've ever done in your life. <laughs> but trust me, it's worth it. Revelations, chapter 1, 2, and 3, all of it. Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 31. So we're going to end there, and we'll continue this next week. This is important. This is important not only so that you could be assured of the salvation that Christ won for you on the cross when he said it is finished, but also so that you can walk out your salvation the way God intended you to and be effective for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have not been saved to sit. We have been saved to be used as a vessel to bring salvation to others. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and invite you all to bow your heads in prayer with me. Father, thank you for rescuing us. We needed to be rescued. We didn't know we needed to be rescued, but you came and laid down your life for us, even when we were at our worst. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus, you died for us. And we don't dare take that for granted. So, Father, we just come to before you right now with reverence and gratitude. Father, my prayer is, is that you would open up the eyes of our understanding to know your word, to receive your word, and, Lord God, to be humble enough to not meddle with your word. We want all of who you are. If we, if we look to change your word, then we're looking to change you and saying that you're not good enough to spend eternity with. Just as we wouldn't ask a, a husband or a wife to engage in matrimony and then seek out to try and change this person that they've married, Lord, we're not going to try and change you. It is us who need to be changed. Amen. And we thank you, Lord God, that the burden of change and transformation isn't so much on us doing these things, but it's receiving all of who you are. Lord, so help us to receive your word, help us to receive your spirit, and let that beautiful transformation happen as we yield to you. If you're in this place right now, and you don't know Jesus, perhaps today is the first time that you've ever heard the idea of salvation, or anyone ever explained it to you, what it means. Let me tell you this. We are absolutely in need of a Savior. And if you're honest, you know it. We spend our lives as human beings trying to make sense of everything and to no avail because we refuse to go to the one who created all things. He and he alone is the one who has the answers. 
He and he alone is the one who can bring salvation. He and he alone is the one who can bring fulfillment to the hole that is in your heart that you've tried to fill with money, fame, fortune, all these different things that we try and do to make ourselves feel like we're valuable. It doesn't work because it is not you who establish your value. It is the authority that made you that establishes your value. It's no different than trying to spend monopoly money. There's no authority that backs up monopoly money and says it has any value. But our currency does because the United States government backs it up. Your value is not established based on what you say or what you've done. It is established on the fact that God created you, he loves you, and has called you to himself to be the bride to him. So he would love you and cherish you and keep you in this day and forevermore throughout eternity. And that is only offered through the man Christ Jesus who came and died for your sins. And if you say yes to him, you will be with him. If you have not said yes to him, he is on bended knee. Better yet, he was on hanging cross asking, will you be mine? And you can say yes to him right now and begin this journey towards the most beautiful life here and the most unimaginable joy in all of eternity. If you need that, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to boldly raise your hand and say yes to him. If anybody needs that, just lift your hand up right now. You're saying yes to Jesus for the first time. Anyone at all? Amen. If you are saved, confessed, repented, baptized, and given your life to to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to lift your hand up high right now. Amen. Praise the Lord. Open your eyes. Look around at all those hands. Go ahead. Put your hands back up. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our salvation. Come on. Family, in this room right here is enough. There's enough love in this room. There's enough talent in this room. There's enough courage in this room. There's enough hope in this room. There's enough experience in this room. There's enough testimony in this room to go out and change this entire city. Listen, Paul walked into a place and it says he turned it upside down. Man, we should turn this city right side up. We can do it. But it, but it takes us having the courage to say yes to him. You said yes to him for salvation. Can you say yes to him to be his minister, to be his vessel, to be his voice, to be his arms, to be his feet, to be his hope, to be his example, to be his ambassador to the rest of this world? That's what we need to say yes to. It's, I'm going to be honest. It's, it's a difficult thing to put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation because we have to override our natural mind and everything that is there, but the Holy Spirit will do that. The same Holy Spirit that allows you to override your natural mind and everything that you thought makes sense to accept the reality of this truth is the same Holy Spirit that will help you override the fear and, and, and hesitation in going out and sharing the love of Jesus Christ with other people. Amen. It's the same Spirit. And listen, He needs you. He could have done it all himself. Don't you know he could just come back and he can just snap his fingers, make a bunch of Jesuses, multiply himself and just send him around the world and just do all the preaching himself? Oh, wait a minute. He did. Because he snapped his finger, he gave the Holy Spirit inside of you and now you are just like him. You have the same love as him when you walk in the Spirit. So he did do that and it's you. You walk in the power and the authority and the love of Jesus Christ. You just got to recognize it. You just got to see yourself that way. And I do my best every week to encourage you and to let you know, to teach you those things. But there's no amount of teaching that I will ever be able to do. No amount of motivational speaking that I'll ever be able to throw at you. No amount of incentive that I will ever be able to do that will get you to do it. It's just something that you got to decide in your heart. God, this is who I am. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart. And it is your decision. If it was my decision for you, we'd already be doing it. If it was his decision for you, you would already, don't you know, you would already be doing it. Now the bottom line is, everybody works for Jesus. Everybody. I don't care 
where you're from, what you believe. Everybody in the end, they work for Jesus because he's in control of everything. But I don't want to just be used by God. I want to be approved by God. I don't want to just stumble into something. I want to be intentional about it. We need to intentionally serve our God with excellence. We need to intentionally go out and minister the gospel to people. This is what you're bred for. This is what you're built for. This is what you're designed for. This is what all those gifts and talents are for. That's what that smile is for. That's what that brain is for. It's to go out and share the love of Jesus Christ with everybody. Amen. And listen, it's not burdensome. When you start doing it, it's easy. And I'll tell you this right now. There is no higher high than going out and being used by God. Amen. When you pray for someone. Amen. When you just walk up to somebody and say, you know what? And, and, and here's the biggest part. When God speaks to you in a moment, he speaks to you in, the, in, in the, your inner man, and you just feel like, man, I just want to go up and just say hello to that person and give them a hug and say God loves you. And they break down there in your arms and begin to cry. When you go to someone and you share the love of Jesus and they are just broken before God and they say, this is what I've needed. There is no higher high than feeling that. And guess what? There's no regrets. You don't have to pay for it. Well, you do. You have to pay with boldness. It'll cost you boldness to go out and do it. But family, I want to encourage you this week. Let's go out and just share the love of Jesus with somebody. It doesn't have to be some big thing. You don't have to get a Bible and stand out on the corner and yell at people. As a matter of fact, I prefer that. You don't do that. And if you do, just don't tell them you go to this church. No, I'm just playing. Whatever God tells you to do, you do it with all your heart, with the love of Jesus and grace in your heart. But family, every week I commission you to do it. Every week. Can we actually go and do it? I'm going to make it easy for you. Outside of these doors, if I could ask the, the ushers to be ready for this, ushers and greeters, we have little cards. It's just a little, little invitation. I keep them in my car. I keep them in my wallet. It's a little invitation that says we would love to invite you to Legacy. And look, I'm making it easy for you. You know, this, is, this has been our go-to play for the last six years. Remember that play that Jared talked about? It's a quarterback sneak. Just get the ball to Jesse and go. Just get him here, and I'll preach the gospel to him. If you get him here, I'll preach the gospel to him. Just invite him. I'll preach the, the love of Jesus to him, but you guys just, just get him here. But I'll tell you this, in the midst of you handing that court, card over, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit's going to rise up in you, and there'll be moments where you just preach the gospel, and they don't need me. They don't need me. I'm just crazy enough to do it. They need you. They need you as a minister. Amen? So let's do it this week. So on your way out, just grab a couple of those cards, and look, just this week, it's a good conference. Hey, I want to invite you to something. What is it, church? If it stumbles out of your lips, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit will take your fishes and loaves and multiply it into a beautiful conversation or something else. Who knows? But let's do it. Amen? Amen.